Hello. Hello and welcome to this workshop called Let's Build an Exploratory Data Analysis Project from Scratch. So as the title suggests, we will be going through the process of building an exploratory data analysis. And this is all completely from scratch. So you will see how we select a data set. In fact, these are the steps that we'll follow. Uh, you will see how we select a large real world data set and we'll use Kaggle to find a data set. Then we will perform data preparation and cleaning using pandas and numpy, the common libraries used for data analysis with Python. And then we will also perform some exploratory analysis and draw some visualizations using the libraries matplotlib and cmon. And then finally, we will also ask and answer questions about the data using a Jupyter notebook. And then we summarize our inferences, write a conclusion, document and publish the Jupyter notebook. And we'll go on for about two to two and a half hours. And you'll get to see the entire process of me selecting a data set, making some mistakes and trying to load it. Um, a lot of a lot of the tutorials that you watch online, typically you see that everything works perfectly. This will be the opposite where a lot of things will break and uh, we will resolve them live. Um, so it's an experiment, but let's see. Hopefully um, we will learn a thing or two. Now, if you wish, you can follow along and everything that I show here, you will be able to follow along. If you wish, you can just pause the video whenever uh, you want and uh, work on, let's say, finding a data set or doing some exploration analysis. Or the other option is that you can watch right now for the one and a half or two hours that we will go on. And then repeat that with the steps that we've just covered. So you will always have this video for reference. Both of these are great. And my name is Akash and I am the founder and CEO of Jovian, a platform for learning data science and machine learning. We have some great courses on data science and machine learning, some free courses and some paid courses as well. So do check them out. You can go to www.jovian.ai to learn more about Jovian and see some of our courses. Now, I just have an announcement to make as well. We are launching a new bootcamp called the Zero to Data Analyst Bootcamp by Jovian, where you can learn industry relevant skills in data science, build real world projects, and start your data science career. So, this is a career oriented bootcamp, and this runs for about 20 weeks. And you can learn more about it here. So, you have two options you can join a 16 week online program, which is primarily focused on mastering data analysis and building some real world projects. Or if you're getting looking to get a job in data science or machine learning, then here you can take the platinum program, which includes four additional weeks, primarily focused on how to make a career transition. And this includes 60 hours of live classes. So we will have classes on weekends um, and also 60 plus hours of self paced material for you to review. Uh, you will complete over 20 weeks, 12 weekly assignments. So everything that we teach will be practical and you will be applying it. And the kind of work that you will be doing is very similar to the topics that we'll cover in the workshop today. You will build four real world projects and uh, all of this will be done via a private Slack group. So we are limiting the enrollment for this batch of the bootcamp to just a hundred people. And this bootcamp starts in about two weeks from now so on march 15th is the first date of the bootcamp uh, so if you're interested do check it out uh, the, the bootcamp website is zero to analyst.com and we'll post it in the youtube description and the youtube chat too uh, we so there's a lot of things that we're offering apart from that there's uh, we will also set up peer study groups uh, resume consulting a linkedin profile review one-on-one -on -one mock interviews and we will include 12 year career support a 12 month career support so if you're interested in making a career transition to data science within the next one year, then this is probably the right thing that you might want to check out. And this is what the curriculum looks like. 
uh, it starts out with programming with python statistics for data science so just building the foundations and you get to also then build a web scraping project with python then we, you will do data analysis with python and learn data visualization and you will work on some assignments and build a second project exploratory data analysis which is what we are going to do today and then we are going to go on to machine learning and uh, all, you will also learn about excel sql and analytics some non coding tools which are very useful in as a data analyst and then finally the last few weeks are dedicated towards career readiness training and you will also build two more projects and all of this is something that you can do in your part time this is a part time program requiring about 16 to 20 hours of work per week so if you're free on weekends then you can take this program completely on weekends and in about 6 months from now you will be job ready to become a data analyst and these are some of the things that we'll cover and we will end up using some of these tools today as well and of course uh, we are also offering a verified certificate of accomplishment and um, this bootcamp will be taught by me so if you've taken any of the courses on jovian and you've liked it so far uh, then we are taking everything that we've done in those courses uh, where we had thousands of participants and we are taking all the resources and all the energy and bringing that to a batch of 100 to make sure that everyone can get great results out of it um, so do check it out if you are interested it is at zero to analyst.com and as i said uh, we have just 100 seats so if you're interested you can enroll now or you can also schedule a one-on-one -on -one call with us okay uh, all right so with that let's get back to the workshop at hand this is the steps we'll follow so what we'll do is we'll take these steps and put them into a notes file so these are the steps to follow so i like to do this i like to always put maybe create a checklist of things to do so that we have somewhat of a roadmap on, on what we want to do so this is an exploratory data analysis project step one is to select a large real world data set from kaggle let's do that let's go to kaggle.com and on kaggle.com we can go to do sign up on kaggle if you haven't already we can go to data and then now we want to do exploratory data analysis and you can already see that okay there's an interesting data set here called the netflix movies and tv shows data set looks interesting worth worth checking out now what i like to do is i like to apply some filters and let's say i like to filter by file size now if you're working on an exploratory data analysis or eda project and you want to put it on your portfolio you want to showcase it on your resume or you want to talk about it in an interview you want to make sure that the data set is large enough you don't want to pick a really small data set so let's say let's pick something larger than 50 mb not too big but something just large enough at least 50 mb and uh, we will we want to work with tabular data now a lot of the larger data sets tend to be image data sets so here we are going to pick a tabular data set that's why i'm selecting the type csv you can also try sqlite but csv is good enough for us right now and let's click apply so already we've applied a filter and you can see that you have about we have about 6000 data sets which have this which satisfy this criteria let me do one other thing one thing that i like to do is uh, use the most votes so that we can find something which has a lot of votes and now you can see that there is some covid-19 research uh, data set okay maybe maybe not this uh, i think we we've, we've covered covid in one of our courses so maybe not this there's historical uh, bitcoin historical data another interesting data set to try out uh, there is one, one another covid 19 challenge okay um and there's this one called us accidents and it contains 4.2 million records now that looks interesting now that is something that would be interesting to put in your portfolio on your linkedin or on your resume that you've worked on a data set with 4.2 million records so um let's check it out and it's about 300 mb in size too okay so this is called uh this is a country-wide traffic accident data set from 2016 to 2020 the first thing you want to do is just learn more about the data set and by the way if you're following along you can scroll down and pick another data set as well perfectly all right 
and uh, you can read the description okay it covers 49 states of the us feb 2016 to december 2020 using two apis etc etc um 4.2 million records looks good these are the people who've prepared it um thanks to them we can analyze this data okay now let's so there's not much we learn about the data by reading the description the next step you can do is uh, look at this data explorer now kaggle very helpfully gives us this data explorer and you can see here that there seem to be several columns now it is showing us 10 columns right now but in total you can see that there are 49 columns so we might as well just select all 49 so there are 49 columns and you can see that for each column we actually have a description so this is uh, id is a unique identifier then we have something called a source which is which api was used to get this data and we have something called tmc or a traffic message channel which provides a detailed description again uh, some number some a severity of an accident this is talking about us accident so this is a severity of an accident between one and four it shows the start time and the end time so if there was a start and end time for the accident most accidents probably might be short then uh, latitude longitude okay uh, okay so if the vehicle was moving so there's a start latitude and a start longitude uh, there is a certain distance there is uh, some description as well very interesting might be useful to do some word cloud analysis there there is a street number um, side of the street etc city county state zip code country now of course country is primarily us time zone airport code so there's a lot of different there's even weather data in here right so this i think this is a very interesting data set definitely worth checking out and especially now you have these things like is there was there a bump nearby was there a roundabout nearby was there a station nearby was there a traffic signal nearby so we can do some analysis about where accidents take place more often okay great so i think we can go ahead with this data set now one option is that we can download this data set to our download this data set to our desktop um but i don't want to run this analysis on my computer i want to use online resources for a couple of reasons one downloads to my computer might become slow and second the kind of compute power that you can get online for free is often a lot larger than what you can get yourself um what you can have on your computer so i'll show you how to start working on it online so what we'll use is we will use jovian the jovian uh, platform now jovian is not only a place where you can learn data science it's also a place where you can work on data science projects so i've just signed in here and you can see my profile and on my profile if you check the notebooks tab you can see all the different data science projects that i've worked on now what i'm going to do is click new notebook now i can see it on my profile and you can sign in on jovian.ai and do this but i'm going to click new notebook here and click on blank notebook and i'm going to call this us accidents analysis okay and i'm going to mark it as a public notebook and uh, great now we have a notebook and we can now click the run button so now this notebook is created but it's not running now on jovian you can save your notebooks but when you run them you need to either download them and run them on your computer or we provide a bunch of options we provide something called binder uh, which is a, an easy Jupyter notebook um, a platform hosted by us that you can use a free platform or you can also use something like google colab uh, either of these is fine in this case let's try google colab because they give you a, a pretty good amount of compute power so just click the run button on the so we click new notebook selected blank notebook and then created a notebook title and then just clicked run and now finally we have a notebook running on colab now why did i not go directly from colab the reason for that is i want to track this notebook on jovian i, I want jovian also provides an easy way to see different versions of notebooks and uh, showcase your notebooks to other people now the trouble with colab is 
you will have to either remember the link somewhere and it will it, it is a bit slow to load but if you put your notebooks on jovian then it, you can share them with other people very easily so that's why uh, we, we took a jovian notebook and then clicked run and went clicked run on collab but now we have the same notebook running on google collab and we can use all the advantages that we get from google collab or all the free infrastructure and even gpus if we need to use gpus like you can go to runtime and then select a gpu runtime and if you have google um, collab pro then you can also select a high ram machine okay and now the next step for us is to download the data set here so i'm just going to tick this one large select a large real world data set from kaggle this is done next step is to uh, download the data and perform data preparation and cleaning using pandas and numpy okay so let's first run the cell this this first cell is simply required to ensure that you can uh, to connect this google collab notebook with the jovian notebook so that we can keep sending snapshots of this notebook whenever we want to save our work back to jovian and we'll see that and let's give it a title so i'm going to create a code cell i'm going to create a text cell and this text cell is called let's call it so I'm, I'm here i'm going to put the title so us accidents exploratory data analysis okay great looks good and then we can create a few code cells and one thing that i like to do is i like to copy over some of these titles into the code cells here so create sections within the code so let's uh, create a text cell here and i'm now i'm using heading 2 so i'm i've put a double hash and let's put in data download here or let's just say download the data so we're going to download the data first then let us go down a few cells and let's put in the next step so what's that called data preparation and cleaning okay so data preparation and cleaning okay that should do okay the next i uh, next step is exploratory analysis and visualization so let's create exploratory analysis and visualization all right we have that now the next step is called ask and answer questions okay that's interesting so we'll ask and answer questions then summary and conclusion so then we, after a few code cells we now have a summary and conclusion all right i think we've gotten to a good place now now we have a rough outline of what we want to do it's always a good idea to just copy over the link here and here you you know put in some to do's here on what explanation you might want to write so i'll just put a to do here uh talk about eda so it's a, just some general uh, talk about eda and to do talk about the data set right so which is source what it contains how it will be useful right so in this case for example the source is kaggle and then it contains uh, information about accidents and can be useful to prevent accidents okay so yeah again this is we've just written it as to do's because uh, this is something that you might want to just roughly write at the beginning um, when you're building a jupyter notebook it's not just about code it's also about some explanations and talking about your project and presenting your project right uh, especially if you're sharing it on your resume or share, talking about it during an interview you want to make it presentable and a good way to make it easy to present your work is to keep adding small explanations like just pointers 
within your Jupyter notebook using some text cells uh, so that you can expand upon them later. Okay. All right. So now we need to download the data. So once again, one way to download it is to click the download button here and then uh, upload it to Google Colab. Uh, but I'll show you an easy trick to download any data set from Kaggle to Google Colab. So go to Google and search open data sets by Jovian. Yeah. So you can see Jovian ML slash open data sets. This is a tool for downloading data sets from online sources like Kaggle. Okay. So let's see. Let's see how to use this library. So we have pip install open data sets. So we're going to pip install open data sets here. Let's also add a quiet. So adding quiet simply removes the output from the pip command. But now that we've installed this open data sets library, it tells you how to download a data set. So data sets can be downloaded within a Jupyter notebook or a Python script using the open data sets dot download helper function. So we just say open data sets dot op import open data sets as OD. So we import open data sets as OD. Then we say OD dot download. And here we need to give it a URL. So it's always a good idea to put any strings into variables. In case you need them later, that becomes a very easy. I'm just going to grab this URL and I'm going to put this in a variable called download URL. And then I'm just going to say download URL. Okay, let's run this. Now, when we run this, Kaggle requires you to provide what's called an API key or a API credentials for you to download anything from Kaggle. And that is something that you can get. Uh, so first let's type a Kaggle username. So I'm just type, typing a Kaggle username. Now I need to get a key. Now to get a key, and the information is given here, uh, to get a key, we need to sign in to Kaggle.com. So we're already signed in. Then click on the profile picture and select my account. So here we have uh, my account. And then, if you scroll down, you will see here some a section called API. And on the API, you can click create new API token. And that's going to let me just save that on my desktop here. Kaggle.json. So I've just saved that Kaggle.json file on my desktop. Okay. And now what we need to do is open up this JSON file. So you can see that there is a username and a key. So I'm just going to grab the key and then put it here. Oops, I think I put the wrong username there. It's called Akashness1. Let me just try that again. This was the username Akashness1 and this is the key. Oops. This is the key. Now you see that. Uh, okay, need to do that again. Let's be careful this time. Akashan is one and here you have the key. Okay, now finally, once you install open data sets, put in the download URL um, into od.download and put in your Kaggle key, then the Kaggle key you can get from your Kaggle account. Once again, you go to the account and then click on, oops. So you go to this image and then you click on your profile or oh, sorry, you click on account. And now scroll down to the section called API and then from the API section, click on create new API token. That's what you want to do. Or if you already have the file, you don't need to download it again. All you need to do is read in from the file and type in your username or and type in your Kaggle key. Okay. Now, if you check this folder, you can see there's a files tab here in Colab. You can see that there's a folder called US accidents. Okay. So US accidents, December 20.csv. That's the file. Now we need to start analyzing the file. So one, one useful thing to do is to just create 
this data directory or just data file name i don't think we need data directory as such so us hyphen accidents us hyphen accidents and us accidents 20 december 20.csv is the file name so let's see us accidents december 20.csv okay now we have the data file name so oh we just downloaded the data so i probably don't need this can probably skip these as well next data preparation and cleaning so let's write down the steps that we will take here again always a good idea to write things down it helps you plan your approach so first we will load the file using pandas then look at some information about the file um fix any missing or incorrect values about the data and the columns fix any incoming or incorrect or missing values okay so these are few things that we'll do so you can also put these as one two three where it makes sense and this is typically how i work on a project i create a text cell and the text cell is a really useful tool within jupyter you create a text cell and put in some steps and then all you have to do is implement those steps now let's start doing that so import pandas oops let's import pandas as pd that's the common layout now we will create a data frame in pandas now if you don't know what a data frame is or what pandas is then you should consider joining our bootcamp and we also have a course that you can check out on jovin.ai to learn about it but let's say pd.read csv so we want to read pandas is a tool for working with csv files or working with tabular data to be more precise and and we're just going to say pd.read csv to read a csv file and give it data file name okay and now that's going to take a minute because we are working with 4.2 million records but this is where you already start to see the power of pandas because if you're working with 4.2 million records you will probably not be able to use excel excel will be stuck for a very very long time on the other hand pandas may take maybe about 20 30 40 seconds but i guess it'll give us a yeah there you go so it it took about uh, i'd reckon 30 seconds and we have the data frame right so now we can type df and that will show us the data frame you can see here it prints it doesn't print everything it prints uh, the first four or the first five rows of data and then it prints the last five rows of data there are 4,232,541 rows and 49 columns okay not bad not bad at all so the first thing then i like to do is learn more about the data now we did look at it on kaggle itself but suppose you didn't have that information on kaggle suppose you were just given a csv maybe this is something that your manager sent you or somebody from another team sent you to analyze the first thing you'd want to know is how to uh, is what col columns it contains and how many columns does it contain what do they represent etc 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 right so a lot of information like this and if it's a large file like this a 300 mb file you can't really open it up in a text editor and read through the columns so you will have to use pandas there so here on pandas once we've loaded the file all we need to do is say df.columns and you can see here that these are all the columns that we are working with source severity start time end time start lat start long end lat end long etc etc a lot of these columns if you want to check the number of columns you can do len df dot columns very simple if you want to check the number of rows you can just do len df and that will give it to you but an easier way to look at this is just to say df.info now if you see df.info it tells you that there are 
two million rows and then you have some of these uh, you have some ids you have some start time end time uh, distance etc okay so looks like these are all the 49 columns all of this is printed so we probably don't even need this so let's go ahead and delete this and you can also see types for each one of these right so some of these are boolean some of these are not and you can also see how much memory it takes up in in this colab notebook right remember colab jupyter notebooks the although you're typing code in the browser the execution is happening somewhere on google servers and that's rather helpful because then we can use the high memory servers that google is giving us okay okay all right now some of these are numbers some of these are not like you can see that latitudes longitudes are definitely numbers you can see that uh, temperature rainfall humidity pressure all of these are also numbers now wherever we're dealing with numerical columns we can also use df dot uh, summary or df dot stats i don't remember but there is a pandas data frame function to get things like mean and standard deviation of each numerical column now since i don't remember it at this point i'll do what we all do pandas data frame um numerical column statistics i think that's what it's called how do you calculate a summary statistics in pandas let's see okay so seems like there is this function called describe and this function called describe is going to give us all of this information right you can look through now i know what i was looking for and that's why i was able to find it very quickly but otherwise you may have to spend a few minutes working through looking through the tutorial now i i remember that it's called something like describe so the moment i saw it i remembered and this is perfectly fine this is a perfectly reasonable way to build a project you don't have to remember every single function i don't after several years of working in this field so we say df dot describe all right so now we're starting to see a little more now let's see wind chill so you have the count this is the number of elements of course most of them are full but in a lot of cases you can see that there's a start longitude so the start longitude has about 4.2 million elements but the end latitude or this end longitude has only 1.5 so it's possible that a lot of accidents were point accidents and a lot of accidents did not have an end la latitude or longitude so this is more of an optional field then you have um, temperature so temperature it looks like 61 degrees fahrenheit is the highest and uh, 1.8 degrees fahrenheit is the lowest what else we see that there is a oh sorry that was a standard deviation so 60 uh, 61 degrees fahrenheit so 6 uh, 6.1 into 10 to the power of 1 so 61 degrees fahrenheit is the highest and minus 89 degrees fahrenheit is the lowest so some accidents are in really cold areas as well one thing to check is are there more accidents in warmer areas or are there more accidents in colder areas so we're already starting to think of questions right and whenever you think of a question it's great that we have a section here already so we can go down and let's say keep writing down these questions are there more accidents in warmer or colder areas pretty interesting another question i have is which state has the highest number of accidents or now this is a this is an okay question but normally what you want is you want to say which states have the highest number of accidents okay so where you can say that okay which which are the five states that have the highest number of accidents that would be interesting so which five states have the highest number of accidents um another thing that you might want to ask here related is how about per capita Right, because it's not fair to compare a state which has only 1 million residents with one that has 50. So you may want to just check accidents per capita. 
and see if that gives you an idea of which state probably has more accident prone roads or more accident prone traffic. Um, let's see if we can calculate this because for this we will require populations of states which we'll have to get from elsewhere. Uh, let's see if we can cover this. But in any case, what you want to do is whenever a question comes to mind as you are going through the data set exploring some of the columns, just note it down. It always helps. Then we have pressure, wind speed, precipitation, a lot of interesting stuff here. Yeah. And how many do we have? Let's see. One, two, three, four. Four, five, six, seven. There should be a way to just check how many numerical columns we have. Let's see. Let's just Google that as well. Pandas count number of numerical columns. Okay. So these are all the numeric types and we can simply select D types which includes just the numerics. Yeah, uh, very helpful. I don't think I could have ever remembered this. And this is really the only way to find this. Even finding it via documentation would be hard. If I hadn't found it, I would probably have asked a question myself because there's no way I would have found this on uh, through the documentation. So let's get that. These are the numeric data types and uh, let's get the simply the columns which have just the numeric data types. So this is just numeric DF and just check the length of numeric DF dot columns. So it seems like we have 15 numeric columns. Okay. So if that was a question, how many numeric columns do we have in the data? We have 15. Great. Why did I do it? I was just wondering how much numeric data do we have to work with it? So if this is numeric data, then the rest of the data is probably dates or categorical data or something else that we'll have to figure out how to uh, process. Okay. Next step. Missing values. So let's see here. We had some, we'd written something out here. Now we have some information about the data and the columns. We have about 15 numeric columns. We have a total of 49 columns. We have, uh, uh, we've seen some of the ranges as well. So let's find missing or incorrect values and let's see if there's anything worth fixing there. Okay. How do we find missing values in pandas? I really don't remember. Uh, so I'll have to look at it again. Yeah, so one way is to do it is to just look for is null. So we can just see is null here. Let's find another example. Pandas is null. Well, let's do this. Let's count numeric. Uh, count missing values per column. Okay. Let's check that. Now counting numeric values per column is s dot is any and then dot sum. Okay. This seems like this might do it. So let's break that down. Is any and sum are the things that we're looking for. So let's do df dot is any. And then this will take a few seconds. But now you can see when we do df dot is any, what it does is each value gets replaced by a true or a false. It gets replaced by true if this value is any or null or empty or missing. On the other hand, if this value does exist and it is not empty, then it gets replaced with false. So if we just do is any dot sum, what that should give us is per column the count of missing values. Okay. So now we have for each column, so you can see that there are no missing values in ID and there are uh, no missing values in source. There are quite a few missing values in TMC. And I don't know what that is. Uh, end latitude, longitude, as we see is a lot of missing values. I think number refers to the number of people involved and there are quite a few missing values here as well. And then you know, there's a whole bunch. 
Now what we might want to do now, let's just put some text here. And we may just want to find percentage of missing values per column. Okay, let's just put it like that. So now this is the total number of missing values and how do we sort it? Let's sort values, I guess. Yeah. So now we've sorted it in ascending order, but we probably want it in descending order. So let's see, let's hover over sort values. Okay. That doesn't help. We may have to look up the documentation. Ascending equals true and ascending equals false. These are the two things that we might need. So let's put in ascending equals true. Oops, ascending equals false. Great, ascending equals false. So now we have end latitude and longitude seems to have the highest number of missing values then we have number precipitation and so on this is good to look at although it would be nice to have it as a percentage so what we can do is we can simply divide this by len df and that will give us give us percentages so missing percentages is this is missing percentages now yeah now this is looking better. So it seems like 64% of the data has missing end latitude and longitude. What would be even nicer is to view this as a graph. So I think what we can do is we can just say missing percentages dot a lot, I guess. And let's see, there's a way to plot um, pandas data frames and especially pandas series. So this is not a data frame exactly. This is a series because here we just have this one column of data and whenever you have just one column, it's called a series. In fact, we can check the type here as well. All we need to do is say type missing percentages. And that has the type series and series is simply one column from a data frame. In any case, we were looking at plot. And in plot, you have this you have this uh, kind of plot to produce so let's create a let's create a horizontal bar plot let's put bar h kind equals bar h and let's see what that gives us ah okay this is looking nice except that it's a bit hard to read one thing that we may want to do is uh, from missing percentages we may want to remove anything that is not that is greater than 0 so i guess the way to do it is filter or okay let's just check that pandas series remove zeros remove a row from zeros or from a pandas series okay so you just filter them out like this not bad or you can filter them out like this so let's uh, we can use this so users not equal to zero how this works is we have this missing percentages series and if we just type missing percentages not equal to zero we get back another series which contains true if uh, the particular row has a value non-zero and false if the particular row has the value zero <coughs> so we may need to just remove the missing percentages um, columns that do not that have all zeros that have that are basically false here so what you can do is anytime you have this boolean series of trues and falses you can use it as an index so now we have this for each row we have a true and a false and then we use it as an index for missing percentages what that does is it only keeps the rows where you have the value true right so missing percentages with indexing into missing percentages not equal to zero gives us simply those columns or those columns column names which do not have which have missing values okay so let's take that missing percentages missing per percentages zero and let's plot that let's call plot on that 
Okay, this is a lot better. So now we have a pretty clear idea. Seems like some of this is pretty small and some of this is pretty um, high. So description, city, sunset, these are very rarely missing, but these are missing most of the time. Now, what you might want to do at this point is if you see something is missing more than half the time, then it's probably not that useful because it's not going to apply to half of the data. So you may even choose to skip it from your analysis. Like I, I think I wouldn't mind skipping the TMC number and end longitude and end latitude from your analysis. Now, if you want, you can remove those columns. You can just say data frame dot drop and there's a function drop that you can look up or you can keep them around and just never use them. Uh, so that's one thing that you can try out. Remove columns that you don't want to use. Okay. And it's always a good thing, good hygiene to just pick the columns that you want to use and stick to those columns. Okay. Uh, another thing that you may want to do is just look at some of the values in each of these columns and see if those make sense. And that brings us to this exploratory analysis section. So what we'll do is maybe we'll pick four or five columns and for each of those columns, we will just plot some graphs and see what they look like. Okay. So let's get, let's once again, check DF dot columns. All right. Now we have quite a few of these. Let me, let's pick a few columns to analyze because we can't analyze all of them right now. Now, depending on the kind of project that you're working on, let's say you're working in a company, then you may already be given some problem statement. So from that, you can derive which columns you need to work on. If not, if it is just a general analysis that you need to do, then you may need to just go through some of these columns and figure out which ones you, you are interested in. Or if there's less than eight or 10 columns, then you may even just analyze all the columns, right? But in this case, let's pick maybe four or five columns we'll analyze. So ID is not a interesting column. It's just a unique ID source again is not very interesting because there's just two values in source. Description is more textual. So there's not much we can do with description while just exploring it. Let's pick one of the numerical columns and something that is related to the accident as well. Um, let's see, let's pick distance and if you're unsure at any point what distance was we can always go back into this data set and read more about it so there's some information here the length of the road affected by the extent of the accident or seems like it's mostly zero okay how about we check city and country um and the country is us so let's just check city so one, one column that we are going to use is city. Then one column that we can use is let's, or let's do start time and let's do start lat and start long. We'll see if we can get some graphs in here or some maps in here. Let us do, I don't know, maybe temperature, temperature would be interesting. And let's look at weather condition. Now what's weather condition? Now we have the benefit of looking at looking at this information here. Let's see what's weather condition. A condition of that shows the weather condition, rain, snow, thumb, thunderstorm, fog, etc. Let's put let's pick weather condition as well. So we have five columns that we want to analyze. We'll just do some basic analysis here, but with each of these columns, there's a lot that you can do. So take your time with it, analyze it. So let's start with city. So we just type df dot city to analyze, to get access to the city column. And you can see these are all the cities. Now, if you want to get the unique this is the city column. Great. Now, if you want to get 
what are the unique cities here so you say unique and that gives you a list so these are the cities okay unique cities and you can just check how many cities there are wow so it seems like there's data from 12200 oops that's seems wrong to me or maybe maybe it is so cities this would be unique city oh yeah this would be sit this would be unique cities okay it seems like there are 12251 unique cities that seems like a lot you may just want to check out maybe a hundred of these okay there are there are a quite quite a few different values here now i'm not too sure if the us has 12000 cities but might were might as well checking into say number of cities in the united states okay so there are uh, this seems like a right number then there are 19000 incorporated places registered in the united states now not all of them may have a high enough population and unfortunately we don't have the population data here let's see if we do not really it doesn't look like we have the population data here would have been interesting to have the population data and then maybe only look at cities with a high population but it seems like we have 12,000 uh, cities in the data set. That's interesting. Now, we obviously can't look at all 12,000 cities. So what we might want to do is look at the number of accidents and some of the top cities by the number of accidents. So I, we say cities by accident, let's say cities by accident. And this is uh, cities. So the oh, so we say df dot city. And now we want a count of the total number of rows for each city. Now you may be tempted to think of a for loop here, where where we iterate over the list of um, cities, and then we create a count for each one. But that's where pandas already gives us very fast efficient and easy to use methods right so anything that you're thinking of doing with the data any question that you have about the data what are the top five accidents uh, what are the top five cities by the number of accidents so it can be broken down into a step-by-step -step thing that can be done with pandas so the first thing could be okay how do i calculate the number of accidents per city how do you calculate the number of accidents per city let's see um how to calculate number of how to calculate count of values i think that's what in a row uh, count of values in a column in pandas so in pandas we can use value counts to easily count the unique occurrences of values so if we do value counts and remember all this while we are working with 4.2 million data points now try doing that with excel and you will face a difficult time yeah so there you go we see that cities by accident you have a lot of cities uh, like houston seems to have a very high number probably is also the most populous city in fact you know, it might be just worth looking at cities top cities by population USA yeah so this is something that is available here you can see that you have New York Los Angeles Chicago Houston Phoenix and it seems like uh, Houston Los Angeles Charlotte Dallas Austin okay seems like quite a few cities from Texas featuring here now, if you want to just look at the first 10 let's just look at the first 10 the top 10 here okay the top 100 maybe that's too that doesn't show up let's try to, top 20 okay now i don't know why new york isn't in here because that seems very interesting that <coughs> a city with the highest population doesn't show up in the list of the highest number of accidents 
so here's something that i i may want to put into ask and answer question why doesn't does new york show up in the data if yes why is the count lower if it is the most populated city right so anything that you notice anything that seems unusual you should take a note and explore it later but one way we can just check if uh, new york is actually present is simply i don't know i i i think we'll have to check let's let's google that pandas check if a value exists in a column so we could do something like okay ankit and df dot value so let's say can we just do new york in cities in df dot city false okay probably doesn't contain data for new york then why is that maybe we may want to just look at the states as well so df dot state i see okay so let's check if ny in df dot state false okay very interesting so now we know now we have some information that this does not contain information about new york right and this is the kind of thing that you have to always take note of now if we had gone ahead with our analysis and then we had published a blog post and then in the blog post we would find that uh, we we'd, we'd report a bunch of things and then people would call us out or let's say worse still that we were doing this in a company and we would present some results and then some decisions would be taken based on that a lot of things could go wrong if you've missed something so it seems like the new data for new york was not present here so we may just want to check it says that it contains 49 states of the usa and the number of states in the us is 50 as far as i remember or 52 current total of 50 yeah so there are 50 states and there are a few territories that make it 52 but that clarifies it for us so any analysis that we are presenting we just may want to mention up front that this does not contain data for new york right so which is something that we may just want to mention all the way at the very top that uh, mention that this does not contain data about new york okay and you should always do this always look for external data to validate uh, the things that you're finding okay but moving forward anyway now we have cities and in uh, you can see that by city we have uh, let's plot this and let's see what we can do here how can we visualize this a little better so if we simply pick cities by accident and we have already sorted them it's already sorted so we can simply do a plot and we can once again do a kind and bar h horizontal bar plot again this takes a while because remember we're working with quite a few data points 4.2 million oops i think we should stop this because remember there are 12000 cities and uh, that's going to be a big big plot so probably just pick the top top uh, 20 maybe and just plot those yeah okay that that makes sense so now we have houston los angeles charlotte dallas austin miami Raleigh, atlanta nashville orlando oklahoma and so on 
Now, one other interesting thing to ask could be which states have the most, which states have cities with the most accidents or maybe let's put it this way that if you look at the uh, among the top 100 cities in number of accidents which states do they belong to most frequently okay now that's a sort of a complicated question but all we're trying to say is how many in the how many of the top 100 cities with the highest accidents does texas have how many of them does california have how many of them does uh, do some of the other states have uh, so that's something that we can uh, that we can analyze so now we already have four questions that's great uh, but we were analyzing city and i think we have a decent analysis here one other thing that i may i can probably we can probably plot is how many cities have the how many cities have you know what's the distribution look like do a lot of cities have a small number of accidents or do a lot of cities have high number of accidents what does that distribution look like right so all of these numbers what is their distribution looking like and the way to do that is to use a, hist a histogram plot so we can use uh, we can import seaborn as sns and i like to use the set style okay i like to use a dark grid theme from seaborn so seaborn is a library just like matplotlib both of these are libraries for data visualization So I like to use a dark grid theme from Seaborn. So we have imported Seaborn here, Seaborn as SNS. Once again, if you want to learn more about Seaborn and Matplotlib and how to do these things, do check out our bootcamp. So Seaborn dot set style. Oops, Seaborn dot set style dark grid. Okay, now we've imported Seaborn, and then we can do a sns dot i think it's hist plot probably yeah and then we give it some data so the data could simply be the cities by accident so cities by accident is ultimately a bunch of numbers now of course each of those numbers is also also has a label a city but ultimately it's mostly just numbers right so it is a panda series you can in fact check the type here type of cities by accident is pandas.series and in fact if you convert it to a list you will see that this is actually a list of numbers right so it's just a list attached with some indexes so if you take any series of numbers and give it to sns.hist plot it's going to draw a histogram for you it'll take a while because there are again tens of thousands of values now if this is a common thing that keeps happening in your data where you're working with a really large data set and okay that was not very helpful i see we don't want a hist plot we probably want a dist plot yeah okay yeah this is what we want now this plot is a deprecated function will be use hist plot okay now this is leading to some confusion about this plot and hist plot but let's say hist plot seaborn example we all all we need is we can just look for an example okay so you can look it up and i'm sure it's not too um not too not too difficult but okay now we've done sns.hist plot and this is what the distribution looks like so it seems like most of the cities have very few accidents like less than um what is this if this is 20000 then this would be approximately 
this would be approximately 10,000 and then this would be approximately 5,000 and this would be approximately 2,000. So it seems like most cities have less than 2,000 accidents, right? So we did see some very high numbers here. We saw numbers like 100,000 accidents in Houston, but most cities have less than 2,000 accidents. So what we may want to do is um, we may want to create two buckets. So let's say high accident cities are cities by accident where the value is greater than where the value is greater than uh, 2000 let's say 1000 okay cities with more than 1000 accidents and then low accident cities so here you will find cities where the accidents are less than 1000 or let's say greater than equal to oops Okay, and let's create these two portions and now what we can look at is what is the number of high accident cities so it turns out that only about 700 cities so that is 700 out of how many cities right so that is uh, 700 out of uh, uh, quite a few cities, I think 12,000 cities. So less than 5% of the cities have more than a thousand accidents. So we've already discovered some insights. So here we can actually start writing some insights. So no data for New York, then less than 5% of cities have more than thousand yearly accidents okay and in fact now for these 700 we can probably do a dist plot separately so sns dot dist plot i accident cities yeah now this makes sense right so now once again you will notice this pattern that everywhere you have this decreasing number so again if you go down you'll see that bit there are a few cities which have more than 5000 like if you want to check more than 10000 you can replace this uh, 1000 by 10,000. You'll find that even smaller number have less than 10,000. So it's an exponentially decreasing kind of graph. You, it's an exponentially decreasing kind of graph. So one thing that you can do is um, let's also take it. Let's also do the disk plot once for the low accident cities. Low accident cities. And even here you see that there is an exponentially decreasing graph, right? So it seems like that the, the number of accidents per city seems to follow some sort of an exponential distribution. And when you're working with exponential distribution, gra drawing graphs becomes very tricky because all of the graphs end up looking like this, like just going down and being flat all the way. So one thing that we can do there is a simple thing where we can use the, a logarithmic scale. So there should be a way to do this. There should be a way to use a logarithmic scale in dist plot. Let's see if either we do it with Seaborn or we can do it with pandas. Seaborn dist plot log scale. Stacked histogram on a log scale. Okay. Log scale equals true. That's all we need to do, I guess. Let's just set log scale equals true here. Let's see if that makes it any easier. And then probably this should be called hist plot. Okay, okay, so now it's starting to look better. No, I think we need log scale on the y. Oh wait, yeah, yeah, this is, this is it. This is it. So it seems like if you look at it now, it seems like uh, most of the cities have between zero to 10. Uh, there, are, there are quite a few cities. In fact, a lot of cities have just zero accidents. Now that seems wrong that a lot of these cities have zero accidents. Maybe it could indicate that there, there is some missing data here. A lot of these cities seem to have zero accidents. But then if you see, uh, so these go from zero to 10, then this portion goes from 10 to 100. This portion goes from 100 to thousand and this portion goes from thousand to 
uh, 10,000 in this portion goes from 10,000 to 100,000. If you see that the chunk of uh, the major chunk of the data, it can, falls in this region, right? So between uh, zero to 100 accidents. So it seems like zero to 100 accidents is where most the major chunk of the data falls. And then you have the rest of the data here. And now this is giving us a much better distribution. Although one thing that we have just realized is that about 1300 or so cities have no data. Now, if we do not have any data for these cities, or maybe it's just one accident for these cities. Maybe there's just, there's just one column for these cities. So if we, let me remove all of this. Yeah. So now if we do some, go a little bit further here and say cities by accident where cities by accident, the value is equal to one. So this gives us all the cities which have only one accident. So it seems like 1,267 cities, so almost 10% of the cities, there has only been one accident reported. And that number seems a bit unusually high because if you probably check two, you will find that that number is lower. So it's possible that it, it's probably possible that there may be some issue here, right? So you may just want to check for the cities which have just one accident reported. Is there some issue with the data? Uh, and one other thing that you can do is you can simply ignore any such value which occurs only once, right? So you can ignore all of these values. You can even ignore any, any value which occurs less than 10 times. Maybe when you are creating some high level analysis, it may help to remove cities which have very few number of rows because you can't really make any useful insights or conclusions using those cities uh, but yeah but one good insight that we have is that over 1200 cities have reported just one accident and remember that this data is over four years so now that that definitely seems a little bit off to me so this is something worth investigating you can just say need to investigate. Okay, great. So that was cities. I think we spent quite a lot of time talking about cities, but um, I think it was worth it because this is the kind of analysis that you need to do. It's not just about looking at a couple of uh, distributions and plotting a couple of graphs and moving on. When you select a column, you really want to understand the column. Okay. These now we discovered, for instance, that the data for New York firm was missing. We discovered that there is an exponential decay. In fact, that's something worth noting down as well. That uh, the number of accidents per city per city follows an let's say decreases exponentially or you can just say decreases or increases exponentially right because it's simply either e power x or e to the minus uh, or negative e power x so decreases exponentially okay we have we have some more analysis here so let's do one more column. Let's not spend too much, too much more time because we also have to answer questions and maybe what you can do after afterwards or by pausing the video is analyze some of the other columns. So I will pick the, let's see, which column do we have? We have latitude, longitude, and then we have temperature. So temperature is a numeric column should be easy to analyze. Then we have the start time. That's also interesting. Are more accidents happening in the morning, in the daytime, in the evening? Which days of the week lead to more most accidents? Okay, let's pick start time. Seems interesting to me. Once again, it helps to just create more sections. Start time. And you can keep decreasing. So you can see that you now I'm using an H3. And earlier here I was using an H2. This was an uh, this was an H2. So let's probably put in an H3 here as well. It's a good thing to just add some some structure, some hierarchy to your code. 
So let's see df dot start time. That's the start time column. I see. I don't find it. Let's see df dot columns. What does start time? Okay, start underscore time. No problem. df dot start underscore time. Ah, uh, so it seems like this is in some strange format. Like if we just look at the first element, it seems like this is uh, this is it. It's a standard format. D D M M Y Y. Uh, sorry, Y Y Y Y M M and D D. So year, month, date. You can see that you have twenty three year, and then you have the time. Now this is currently a string. But what we want is we want to convert this into a date. So you may want to just check how to parse dates in pandas. So you can just do two date time. Okay. Let's see an example of this. PD dot two date time DF. Okay, so it seems like we can simply convert the row into a date time row so if we do pd dot to date time pd dot start time start underscore time that should give us a date time column oops this should be df so pd is pandas we imported pandas as pd and then on pandas we are calling pd dot to date time and then we are calling df dot start time here okay and now it's converted into date time now uh, you can even check so let's just store this back into df dot start time so we will override the original column with the new data which contains date time objects okay now you can check uh, df dot start underscore time zero and you can see now that is a timestamp so that's pretty good and Remember we had a few questions, so let's just note down those questions as well in case we forget. So one question that we wanted to answer was what time of the day are accidents most frequent in? And similarly, which days of the week have the most accidents? Again, you may also want to ask which months have the most accidents and then what is the trend of accidents year over year decreasing increasing okay now if you're living in the us you may also just want to check the data for a particular state maybe the state that you're living in how safe is your state? Now, what does the trend look like? Has there been a sharp increase or decrease in accidents? And does this information change from state to state? Okay. So what we can do is probably we'll do, uh, we'll analyze as we start to analyze start time, we'll also answer some of these questions so that we are also covering some of these bases here on of asking and answering questions. Now, by itself there's no real plot you can do with date uh, with the start time column because it's just a timestamp right it is the exact time so each accident obviously has occurred at an exact different exactly different time so what we can do is we can pull out pieces of information from the start time and store that in new columns and this is where you have something called date part and this is something called date part um or i think we can just search pandas get let's say time of let's say hour of day let's just get the hour of day from date time so return hour from date time column all we can do is we can just say dot hour so if we just do uh, dt dot start time dot hour that's going to give us the hour 5 okay so instead of doing this for the a specific value, we can simply do that for the entire column. Okay, we can't.
Okay, we need to use this PD dot date time index. All right, let's try something else. Sales dot index dot hour. That's what it looks like. So df dot start time dot index dot hour. Still doesn't make sense. Okay, so start time is a timestamp. Let's go back. Let's see. Pandas get hour from timestamp. So we've already done PD dot two date time. And then there seems to be something called dot dt what's dt dt dot hour okay let's see so a series has something called uh, a dot dt part and you can do dt dot hour to get the hour so pandas dot start time dot dt dot hour all right so now you can see that now we have this information which is the hour of the day and now we can do a sns dot hist plot so this is a histogram that we want to draw once again now if you want to understand what a histogram is and why we're using a histogram not a bar plot etc etc uh, do check out our boot camp hist plot and there you go right so now you can see that uh, let's say let's just put a number of bins as 24 we know that there are 24 hours in a day yep this is it so you can see that from midnight to 6 p.m or 6 a.m or 4 a.m there seems to be a decrease and that decrease kind of continues here so it's Ideally, you should probably start the day at 4 a.m. It seems like and at 4 a.m. You have about uh, Okay, we should we probably want percentages here. It seems like this is Not very useful. I mean, it's, it's use useful, but we may just want percentages. Let's see if we can get SNS hist plot percentages All right, doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, let me go back to a dist plot. Yeah, so this, this is sometimes tricky finding the right graph and uh, documentation for the right function. But I hope you're getting a sense. I hope you're getting a sense that it's not really remembering all these plots and all the syntaxes that is very important. What's important is to be able to analyze the data and ask questions about the data and figure out then Google or read the documentation or do whatever you need to do to figure out what it is. That, uh, figure out uh, how to get what you want. Okay, I'm still not getting percentages here. One thing that I'll just do is I'll simply divide by the length of the data frame. And that will give me a, that's a quick hack to convert these into percentages. Oops. No, that, that shouldn't, that doesn't do it. Okay, never mind. Uh, so you can see here that um, I'll leave a note here for myself. Figure out how to show percent pages let's do one last search norm hist there it is
okay finally yeah so you can see that uh, it's five six seven eight five six seven eight yeah so it seems like most accidents happen between seven to nine a.m and now you can probably guess that some of these uh, the reason for this is probably people leaving uh, leaving for work in a hurry to get to work but let's start noting down some of these inferences so a high percentage of accidents occur between 7 a.m to 9 a.m or is that 10 a.m so this is 5 a.m this is 6 a.m this is 7 8 yeah so between 7 to 9 a.m or even if we look at it more broadly we can say between so this is 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 yeah more broadly between 6 to 9 6 to 10 a.m right or 7 to 6 to 10 a.m so most accidents happen between 6 a.m to 10 a.m probably people in a hurry to get to work and what this could also be that it's just that traffic is higher during the day uh, traffic is higher from 6 to 10 a.m because people are getting commuting to work and that's why the number of accidents is high so what would be interesting is to look at the traffic chart and compare that with the accident chart and then see accidents per unit traffic and see if that number is higher right so let me note that down so when is accidents per unit of traffic the highest okay and i'm not sure we have traffic information here let's see if we do have traffic information traffic signal turning loop i doubt it yeah i don't think we have any kind of traffic information in this but that's where then you might want to just grab you might just want to grab an external data set which is uh, minute by minute traffic information i don't know if that's a, or even hour by hour traffic information and compare that uh, and then include that into your analysis in some way but yeah what we know is that between 7 to 9 am uh, or 6 to 10 am is the highest number of accidents and then the next region the next region where you have a pretty high number of accidents is just around 3 pm let's say from 3 pm to 4 5 6 pm right so 3 pm to 6 pm once again seems to be quite a major area where accidents happen so that's something that you may want to note down as well let's just take it down here next highest percentage is is 3 pm to 6 pm okay we have some insights too so effectively we've answered this question which time of the day are the accidents more frequent in and what you can do is now you can either move this question up or you can move uh, the graph down uh, but th all that rearrangement is something that we can do at the very end then uh, let's do another let's do maybe day day of the week okay day of the week is probably different so pandas dt day of week that's pretty common so dt dot day of week monday is zero sunday is six that's what it seems to be so now we say dt dot day of week oops it was just day of week without any underscores and uh, now we just need these seven bins yep so now during the day if you look at day of week it seems like it's evenly distributed on weekdays and now it, it's low on weekends right so now this is where you see a deviation from normal exponential or gaussian curves because of systems that we have created we have created these systems where we have weekends and on weekends there are fewer people traveling for work so most people are at home uh, or if they're traveling they're not traveling as much so you can see that on weekends 
the number of uh, accidents is lower not bad that's a good good insight to have it's obvious but still works to verify it now you can go one step further and you can say only check those cases only check those uh, on weekends is the distribution of accidents by hour the same as on weekdays okay let's take that question down is the distribution of accidents by by our the same on weekends as on weekdays can that helps us test our hypothesis about people going to work now people do go to work on weekends as well but there's probably people uh, i i would hope that it is more spread out so let's discover that i don't know uh, so how do we do that the way to do that is first we need to get the data just for week weekends and the way to do that would be we say df dot start time and then from df dot start time we get df only let's say we just want it sunday so then we could do df dot start time dot dt dot day of week equals seven uh, equals six so that would be sunday and you can see this if we just do day of week equals six then that gives us falses and trues and we can then plug that as an index and this is something that can confuse you if you're just getting started with pandas but you can take this uh, string of falses and trues and plug that as an index into df dot start time looks good and then we also wanted saturday so let's just grab saturday so here we say or df dot start time or day of week equals five so this is weekends start time okay now this i guess it's a little more complicated than just doing an or so how about we just get sundays okay and then now we can see check the distribution for sundays so we can grab the same code that we had here dist plot and instead of analyzing entire data for df dot start time we can just do sunday start time dot dt dot hour and plot it and indeed now we can see now that on sundays there is a more spread out distribution right so now that's a very interesting find i'm quite excited to find it and i had no idea it would turn out this way but it seems like on sundays it's during the afternoon that most accidents occur unlike on mondays where it would be let's check mondays and verify that the trend is quite different for mondays let's put zero here and that would be monday There you go. So on Mondays, you, there's definitely a very different trend compared to Sundays, right? Great. Now, interesting insight. So on Sundays, and you can verify this about Saturdays as well, and then you can combine the two data frames and do a lot of such things. But on Sundays, the peak occurs between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Unlike weekdays. And you can see here how some human systems that we've built mess with the generic statistics now if you look at this here now this is a nice gaussian curve like you take some of these r's and put them here uh, and you get a nice gaussian curve a bell curve what is called a normal distribution but as soon as you have this system that has been put in place by humans um, so then you don't get this Gaussian curve anymore. But in fact, what this might be representing is two Gaussian curves. One is people going to work and then one is people returning from work, right? So there's, so there's a lot of such deeper analysis that you can do and take this time spend. Now we've just spent a hour and a half right now, but we've already unlocked so many great insight from just a couple of columns. And there's even more to drill down. Um, just keep thinking anything that occurs to you just note it down in the ask and answers question section and uh, drill down into it and 
check it out okay so that was um, that was days of the week let's do one more and then we'll move on to another column and we are answering questions already so i won't put anything into this section but you may have to just rearrange some of the codes you can pick up some of this code from here and then put it put it over here later on but let's do let's do the month so once again we do let's grab the hist plot or disk plot code here's the disk plot code now we do dt dot month and then we just need 12 bins for the month okay that's pretty interesting it seems like january february march not much is happening and then towards the end of the year it seems to be pretty high is that a real trend or could there be something could there be an issue with the data let's see if this data here says that it goes from february 2016 to december 2020 what that means is there is some missing data for january of 2016 because ideally we would have wanted four months in each year but here we have february for february 2016 so it's possible that there may be a little more uh, like the, the data here might should be a little higher probably 20 25 percent higher in these regions but overall it definitely looks like around the summer the around the summer the accident uh, number of accidents is somewhat low and then it starts to pick up and it seems to be the highest around december now that's an interesting trend to figure out why right so now i'll leave this as an exercise for you can you explain the trend the month wise trend of accidents now how will you do this you will have to drill down into this data itself or you can just look it up let's uh, you can just search that why are there more accidents in december in the winter let's say okay so now there's a question are car accidents more likely to occur during winter three major causes of winter accidents and how to avoid them um yeah so there seems to be is it true that there seems to be more car accidents in the uh, winter months yeah okay so now there's some research for you to do and then of course you can also look at just the data for a particular year so what you can do is you can oops i think we were just looking at mondays let me just find uh, df dot start time yeah but the trend is quite similar so what you can do is maybe you can look at just the data for a particular year so let's say df uh, data frame of 2020 let's just look at the data for 2020 or maybe 2019 because maybe all the data from 2020 has not come in so df dot start time dot year dot dt dot year equals 2019 and uh, let's see what this gives us start time dt dot year yeah so this is uh int right so let's check for 2019 and this gives us a list of trues and falses we plug that into df and then we just get the accidents for 2019 now from the accidents for 2019 we get the start time and then we get the month from the start time and then let's plot it so let's look at 2019 okay so now you see here that the data is a little more balanced when you look at a particular year 2019 maybe let's look at 2018 again pretty balanced so there's it's marginally higher but when you go year by year so suddenly things start to become a little more clear so it's possible it's possible that there just may be maybe we didn't collect enough data for 2016 or 2017 yeah now this this explains it right this seems like this definitely seems like an off trend that this this definitely seems wrong 
So maybe the system was just set up or this API or this data collection system was set up being set up in 2016. And that led to this kind of a distribution coming up. So when you look at a typical year like 2019, it's quite balanced. Yes, it's, it's definitely a little bit higher on, uh, but not too high, right? You can see that it's eight and then that, uh, this is about 10 or 10% and this is about 12%. So all the, all the months seem to have approximately equal. Now the winter months are a little bit higher, but it's not as high as the entire trend. So we've just explained that uh, much data is missing for 2019. For much data is missing for 2016 maybe even 20 maybe even 2017 okay so don't just look at a graph and report a trend that there are more accidents in december i'm sure if you look at some of the analysis for the data you will find people have reported that you need to dig in and you need to ask the question why and when you dig in that means slicing and dicing looking at ear looking at um the source maybe you may also just want to split there are two sources you can see i think that I think there's a column called source. Let's see df dot source. Is there a column? Yeah, there is a column called source. So maybe you want to just compare the map quest data or just the Bing data. So let's see df 2019 Bing is df 2019 where the source is Bing. So let's just see df 2019 dot source equals bing yeah so bing ha definitely has this trend but what about mapquest mapquest also shows this trend so it seems like mapquest uh, and bing show the same trend oops maybe i did not really put it in so this was let's check bing Yeah, so now Bing definitely shows a far more, a far higher count for December. But on the other hand, you see MapQuest. And MapQuest is pretty balanced. So there seems to be some issue with the Bing data. So now one other thing that we notice is there seems to be issue with the bing data and this is the reality of real world data that you will have all of these issues you will have this missing data which is again not missing values inside rows but rows that are missing altogether right because nobody was reporting them or a system was still being set up or data coming from multiple sources and they have different distributions now if both bing and Map mapquest were perfect or were even reliably counting accidents they should have similar distributions, but it seems like they don't. So now uh, you may, you may just want to, I don't know, throw away Bing data because it seems to be a little bit unreliable or may, you may just want to go and look up how accurate is Bing data and how accurate is MapQuest data and use that. Let's even look at a plot here and let's maybe do a pie chart. We've only been drawing histograms uh, let's do a value counts first yeah okay so it seems like uh, a pretty high percentage what would this be 50 60 about 60 65 percent is probably coming from bing and uh, from mapquest and then there's about 30% or so coming from Bing. So I wouldn't mind throwing away Bing data at this point because that may just lead to some false inferences. And um, at least I would want to filter out Bing data for some of the analysis here. So let's just take that note. Consider excluding Bing data seems to have issues. Yeah, so we can throw away Bing data and we can still have 65% of the data that is still about, I think more than 3 million rows. 
that's still a lot of data to analyze that's still a lot of great trends to find out so i wouldn't worry about losing maybe at 20 30 percent of the data especially if it is faulty and can lead to incorrect conclusions okay okay so we've answered a lot of questions related to the start time of the accident we know distribution by hour we know distribution by week a day of the week we know distribution by uh, the month of the year we've identified some problems in the data collection all of this has happened because we chose to just spend some time with it let's do one more let's do maybe let's do start latitude and start longitude that's called start underscore lat and start underscore long and let's see if we can maybe draw some maps and then we'll wrap up we'll do some basic cleanup so start latitude and longitude okay and uh, let's see df dot start lat and then df dot start let's just check that what values look like here and df dot start long or okay is that long yeah that's long I don't know what it's called. Is it called LNG? Yeah, it's called LNG. Okay. Great. Now it would be nice to let, let's first just do a scatter plot. Maybe we can just do SNS dot scatter plot and give it the X and the Y. So the X could be DF dot start. Let's see. The longitude. So if you if you check this a quick check now latitude and longitude how it works is you have longitudes are vertical lines so as the longitude changes we are moving left to right and latitudes are horizontal lines so as the latitude changes we are moving top to bottom right now let's not do a map let's just do a scatter plot and the x should be the long uh, the longitude lng so that we move left to right with the scatter plot and the y should be the latitude so we go up and down so df dot start lat and let's just plot that now it's quite a few points that's 3.2 million points that might get pretty crowded yeah that's quite a few points but voila we are already looking at a map of the us now of course it's a bit warped because we're not exactly plotting to scale here but you can see that this is already giving us some information now we may want to just reduce the sizes of the points so let's see sns scatter plot point size okay now let's uh, do let's just hover over this and let's see if we can fit the point sizes size let's see here parameter size is either vector or a key in the data i don't know i don't know what to let's try let's give it a shot let's see what happens if we put point zero zero one now because it's taking a while what i'll do is i'll just create a 10 percent sample so sample df is df dot sample point one okay and then i'll just use sample df dot start time and sample df dot start latitude and just use that 
let's even stop this forget about it okay now we have a sample data frame well let's do 0.1 times length of the data frame that gives us a 10% sample and convert it into an integer yeah so now we have a 10% sample and now we can just do a scatter plot with a 10% sample now that should be a lot faster yeah okay so now you see that we've reduced the point size we've reduced the point size to 0 0.001 and now you can see that it kind of plots the same it kind of plots the same uh, the same set of values here where you have uh, you have but it, it does show because now we've made the point smaller it does show some sort of density you can so you can see that there's a lot of density around along the coast that is where a lot of the population also uh, is living and there is less of a density here uh, in the center okay now it would be nice to just put this on a map in some way so let's see how we can do a scatter plot on a map uh, plot lat lat long on a map okay in python and i think there's a library called folium that is that can be used to do this let's see mapping points with folium so let's see if we have folium here import folium yeah we do have the folium library so we should be able to draw a map and then okay we have some latitude we have some longitude so we have latitude longitude now let's see how folium is used so we create a map folium.map and then we can put points on the map let's see let's let's try and copy paste this code and then we try and fix it maybe first we start by creating a map there you go map folium dot map that gives us a map great i think we may just want to what what happens if we drop the location and drop all of this okay now we have a world map okay that's a start that's a start and let's maybe just try and put one point on the map how do we put one point on the map let's get maybe a lat and a lawn as df dot start lat zero and df dot start lng zero and let's just see what that value okay thirty nine and minus eighty four now folium let's see let's see if we can put a marker so we just put marker so let's just put folium dot marker and what does a marker require marker requires a location and a location is a tuple so let's just give that a lat and a lawn okay my map disappeared oh we need to show the map we need to return the map so let's put map here and let's just type out map to see the map and we need to add the marker to a map so we've not yet added the marker so now we need to this is a marker marker and marker dot add i guess that's how it's done here add to oh sorry marker dot add to map okay so now we've plotted one accident and we may want to just change the 
we may want to then okay now you can what, what you can do is you can iterate over the list maybe you can pick a sample of let's say a thousand accidents and plot it let's see let's pick a sample of thousand so let's do four x um let's say for lat lawn in okay i'm not sure how to iterate over a pandas data frame let's try it out here for x in df dot sample let's take 100 sample 100 print x let's just see what what gets printed okay it seems like an entire series gets printed so let's just check here how do you iterate over map how do you how to iterate over a data frame using for iterate over rows and columns and pandas data frame okay you can get do this using iter iter items iter rows and iter columns so iter items what does that give us let's just check pandas dot df dot sample dot iter items and let's just print that okay so each one is now this whole thing with a bunch of values and let's maybe just keep the latitude start lat and start lng okay and then we'll wrap up quickly once we are done with this so start lat and start lng and just keep these two and then keep printing those okay now this is yeah so now we have start lat and let's print x dot start lat and x dot start long okay that's just a tuple is it so let's just print x zero and see what what you have here and x one yeah so this is what we want x one contains some information which is the two latitudes and longitudes uh, but in any case i think what we want is we want to iterate over the for loop and then plot a bunch of points and we can do that and we'll figure that out shouldn't be so hard but what would be nice would be to show a heat map right so show maybe based on the density of points show a heat map so i'm going to search python pandas polium heat map okay so let's see heat maps and let's see how to do heat maps in polium let us look at heat maps with time series okay let's do a heat map now this does not take data frames you need to give it a list of lat lawns and a list of lists each should be like this and nans will also trip it up okay so you, you need to give it something like this right you need to give it a list of lat long pairs and you can do this using volume dot heat map so let's see let's import heat map from folium so we import a heat map from folium then we need to create a map so let's create the map that we had let's keep the map okay now we have a map and let we now need to add the heat map to it so now the heat map goes in with the heat map data we need to create a heat map data and add it to the map 
Now, how do we create the heat map data? The heat map data is a list of lat long pairs. Well, I'll show you a quick trick. If we take df dot start lng and convert it to a list, that will give us a list of longitudes. Similarly, if we take df dot start lat, that will give us a list of latitudes. Now we can call zip on these and that will give us a list of pairs. Where did it go? Yeah, now it gave us a list, but now if you, if you convert this into a list, you can see that this will give you a list of pairs. Yeah, okay. And you can search this as well. It shouldn't be so hard, but uh, basically what we want is we get all the latitudes as a list. We get all the longitudes as a list, and then we turn them into pairs, and then we can probably just put this zip into the heat map. And I think that should be it. That should give us the heat map. So let's just say, let's just put this zip list. And this should be folium dot heat map. Dot plugins dot heat map. Okay. Let's see. I think we need to install the plugin for heat map. Let's see how to get a polium plugin heat map. Let's just try from folium dot plugins import heat map okay got it All right, this is taking a while, but it seems to be working finally. Once again, you can start this. You can do this with a sample because we are doing it with 4.2 million data points. That's a lot of data to put into a map. And there's a lot of processing that is going on there as well. I may just want to create a sample data frame so that we can actually look at something. So sample DF. In a lot of these maps, you can also you can work with just one person of the data and still get a pretty good result. Let's say df dot sample, and I'm just going to pick int of 0 0.01, so just one person of the data, which is still 40,000 data points times the length of the data frame. And then instead of, and now we can create the lat long pairs, and we can simply use this zip with the sample df. I think we may just have killed the machine because yeah, okay, no, it we didn't. Yeah, so now we have forty thousand points or forty thousand combinations of latitude and longitude. Still seems to be a bit high. You know what? Let's try with maybe a hundred. These are all the practical difficulties with working with real world data, um, a large data set especially. But yeah, there you go. Now, if we zoom in here, now this here we've just picked the first hundred, right? Now, if he's so, let's maybe take not a one percent but a point one percent sample. So that would be about four thousand points and let's see if it can plot a heat map with 4000 points still takes a while 
another way to do a heat map is just using matplotlib or seaborn itself okay still too high i think we just may want to do just about a 500 just about 400 points then just create a heat map based on that ah i see i have not put in sample df here my bad let's try the one person data again yeah okay this is looking good this is looking good we may just want to zoom in here a bit maybe one person is still too high but yeah i think this is this is looking pretty good now you may just want to center the map i don't know what the zoom level is uh, you can try a uh, you can try a zoom level you can try putting a center for the map but roughly now you can start to see this looks pretty interesting you may just want to reduce this further let's try a 0.1% sample maybe a 0.1% sample will give an even better result yeah that's pretty nice so now we have here a heat map now you can see where where the highest number of accidents happen so it seems like both the coasts definitely have a high percentage of accidents and then you have lower very few or even zero accidents in the middle regions in fact we may have just skipped many of the states because we are working with a sample here but the bigger sample you take the more detailed this map will get and there are many other parameters that you can control on the heat map like you can control the colors which when when does something become red when does something remain green uh, you may just want to do like a some sort of a a logarithmic scale rather than a linear scale because accidents follow this logarithmic pattern or this uh, exponential pattern so if a region has accidents it probably has exponentially higher uh, accidents than other regions and that's why you see this sharp drop off so you may want to do a log scale there for the heat map but i hope this gives you a, uh, an idea so coming back what we've done is we have performed some data preparation we have performed some exploratory analysis and visualization we have asked and answered questions now you can see here we've asked a lot of questions uh, here and we've answered most of them uh, these are some exercises for you to do which state five states have the highest number of accidents how about per capita now to get per capita you would have to get state wise population not very difficult load it using a csv file into pandas and you can simply insert the population as a row using a merge so again if you want to learn about how to merge arrays you can come join our bootcamp and we'll go over such projects in a lot more detail and we'll learn everything from scratch over 20 weeks so you can do that and here are a few more questions for you to try out so we've asked and answered quite a few questions we've also summarized some of our inferences and conclusions so whatever data insights we've drawn we've summarized them we have summarized uh, we've listed out a few insights here again then the next step is to document publish and present your jupyter notebook online now this is where you may just want to clean up you may want to add the right headings you may want to take the to do's that we have in place for instance we have this to do right at the top uh, you can take some of these to do's and answer them uh, and uh, complete them um, add more detailed explanations here you, you can take these to do's and add more detailed explanations what you want to have is you want to have one heading this header at the top at the very top and then you have some explanation here and then you have the step by step level 2 headers data preparation and cleaning exploratory analysis and visualization start um, this should be a level 3 header not level 2 yeah then you have uh, all of these should be level 3 headers yeah exploratory data analysis then asking and answering questions is another header summary and conclusions so at the top level your notebook has this kind of a structure then inside each one let's say in data preparation and cleaning you can have another set of headers one is to load the file one is to look at some information then is to fix and fix missing and incorrect values similarly for exploratory analysis you may want to just have headers for specific columns like you have this header for city 
and this has all the code for city and all the analysis for city start time start latitude and longitude and similarly now for ask and answer questions you may want to have headers for each of these columns as well okay and uh, for each of these questions you may want to have a level 3 header and then inside each question what you want to do is you want to um, uh, explain your approach how are you going to answer the question write the code then draw the graph if there's a graph then plot the graph and then finally write the answer to the question which you have inferred by looking at the graph right so you need to explain what's happening it's not just to say just have a question and have some code below it you need to explain exactly what's happening so please do that and then finally we have some summary and conclusions and one good thing to include after summary and conclusions is areas for future work now what would be a good place to continue we've simply analyzed three of the columns here now you can imagine there is such a huge wealth of data in this data set now now that we start analyzing it right and what you can do is you can write out a few ideas a few project ideas let's say if you're doing a state wise analysis what are all the things that a state wise analysis should contain or let's say you are doing a seasonal analysis of accidents what are all the things that a seasonal analysis should contain or such things just write out a few project ideas and briefly very briefly just mention them at the end of your notebook what that shows is that your insight and your analysis was not limited to just what you have shown but you know that a lot more can be done but of course because you have to end a project somewhere so you have chosen to do only a few things uh, but you have many ideas about what more can be done so do mention that and once you put this together you can then upload this notebook to jovian and one simple way to do it is to run import jovian inside this colab notebook and then run jovian.commit now remember this jovian.commit will work only if you have run this notebook from jovian so when you run jovian.commit you will have to go back to your jovian profile click on this copy api key button and then paste it here and that is going to upload your colab notebook to jovian remember that we started out with this notebook called us accidents analysis and this exact same notebook is now updated to version 2 so every time you save some every time you've done you've done some significant amount of work you can just run jovian.commit and it will keep picking up newer and newer versions each time okay it's going to pick up a new version and you can see now version 3 got created and when and now you can shut down this colab notebook uh, the infrastructure you're no, no longer using and you have this read only view you can see all the analysis you can take this link and you can share it so if i go on the youtube video that is currently live now you can go on this youtube video and you can share this link so here you have the accidents analysis notebook right in front of you okay yeah and uh, that's it so that is how you present your notebook now you can put the same jovian link in your resume as well and if you're listing a project you're saying that you've done this analysis on us accidents and you're not putting a link to it then that's a huge missed opportunity because you've done all this work but you're not providing any proof of your work so put up your notebook either on jovian or put it up elsewhere on uh, github but jovian is a nice place because it, it is designed for jupyter notebooks so it renders a very nice preview of jupyter notebooks it's even mobile friendly put it up on your resume link to it and add good explanations make sure that you've polished all the explanations it's like a project that you people will look at it as an example of the kind of work that you will do when they hire you okay so keep that in keep that in mind okay i think with that we reach the end of uh, the topic here now i just want to quickly remind you now we have the we have this bootcamp called zero to data analyst bootcamp by jovian now if you enjoyed this session we are going to have two sessions like this every weekend for 20 weeks and we are going to cover all the topics starting from programming with python where we will learn programming we will uh, obviously we learn python functions classes modules but we will also learn about linux git terminal so also a lot of the common command line tools that people use you will get you will become familiar with git and github and we will also look at web scraping which is again a very useful tool to create your own data set so you'll find that a lot of the data sets on kaggle are created using web scraping 
So there is an interesting project on web scraping that you will also build. Alongside, we will also build the mathematical foundation for data science. So things like probability and uh, distributions. So I was talking about Gaussian distributions and exponential distributions. We'll cover that in a lot of detail. We will talk about, so we will cover a little bit of linear algebra. We will cover a little bit of um, measures, uh, things like hypothesis testing, correlations, and uh, such topics, which are again, quite common in data science. Uh, so we'll cover just enough mathematics that you need to know to become a data analyst or a machine learning uh, engineer. Then we have a couple of weeks dedicated to data analysis with Python, a few weeks, actually four weeks for data analysis with Python and data visualization two parallel tracks in data analysis with Python. We will look at uh, how to work with data sets, how to use things like NumPy, uh, pandas to analyze data. We will also see how to work with really large data sets, which have tens of millions of rows. Right now we were looking at millions and alongside in data visualization, we will learn from scratch matplotlib, Seaborn, the two libraries that are most commonly used, but also things like Folium and uh, Plotly is another library that we will look at. And then we'll also look at things like word clouds, how to work with text data and visualize text data. And we have some very interesting assignments planned for you and you will build an exploratory data analysis project, the kind of project that I should just showed you but uh, much better obviously and much more much well presented in fact we will focus a lot on presentation on how to build a great portfolio project that you can showcase proudly on your profile and then finally we'll cover some advanced topics so we will cover machine learning this will not be a detailed machine learning course but we will cover just enough machine learning that as a data analyst you will be able to do a little bit of regression a little bit of uh, decision trees uh, do some clustering so supervised unsupervised the idea here is not to make you a machine learning expert, but the idea here is to give you the machine learning skills so that you can apply them when necessary. And it's also a very good qualification to have on your, uh, in your profile or on your resume. If you look at a lot of job data analyst job listings, you will find that machine learning is a good suggested, a good to have skill. And a lot of companies are now shifting a lot of the data anal analysis roles into machine learning. So you will fit right in where 80, 90% of your work might be data analysis and about 10% might be machine learning. And it will set you up well to go into a full-time machine learning role, maybe uh, six months, eight months down the line when you've collected enough experience in data analysis for about nine months to 12 months or about a year of experience. And this is one thing that people often miss. If you want to get into data science, do not spend a year learning data science, machine learning, deep learning, etc., because then you will have to start from zero experience rather we recommend getting into a data analyst role and this bootcamp is going to take you there and then on the side continue learning continue becoming better continue learning deep learning machine learning natural language processing or whatever is a reinforcement learning whatever is the new thing that is um interesting to you uh, seems interesting to you and is in demand in the job market right so your career and learning always go hand in hand you cannot just now once you're out of college you cannot uh, really expect to learn everything and then go into the next thing. You have to learn on the side. And that's why we also designed this bootcamp to learn on the side, right? All of this is based on hundreds of conversations that we've had with people over the past few months. And that's what, that's why, that's how we've put it together. And finally, now we know that a career transition is hard. And then that's why we've dedicated three full weeks towards career readiness. Now, what you will be doing here is one, you will be polishing up all of the projects. So there'll be ample time for you to improve and you know, resubmit and get your projects reevaluated. And we'll be evaluating each one personally. So you will polish up all your projects, put them up on Jovian, on GitHub, um, and then create a solid resume, a resume which will have all of these four projects, the three projects, web scraping, exploratory analysis, classical machine learning, and possibly also an, uh, a fourth project of your choice, whatever you want to work on. And then we will also work on your LinkedIn profile. We will uh, do some preparation for interviews. So we will talk about what kind of rounds you have, what kind of questions you might face, where, do you, how do you practice? And you will also attend one mock interview with us right and that's the reason why we're limiting the batch size to just about 100 because we want to work personally with every single person and make sure that by the end of 20 weeks if we were hiring a data analyst we would be happy we would be glad or we would feel lucky to hire them that's our objective here we're training people as if we wanted to hire them ourselves so 
Yeah, that's what it looks like. And then after week 20, you have ongoing career support where you can continue to get help from us with whatever you need, anything that you need. Um, if you need help in, with a project, you can get that. If you need help with uh, applying for interviews, you can get that. You need help with improving your resume, you can get that. You need help with negotiating an offer, you can get that. You are in a job and now you need help with a project, we'll still support you to the extent that we can, of course. Um, but yeah, so we so we'll have ongoing career support for 12 months for you. And these are some of the tools that we'll cover. And you'll see that we can we are not only covering the coding based tools, but we're also covering things like SQL, Excel, and Tableau, because a lot of companies are using these tools now. And it's important to use GUI tools or know how to use them because sometimes you may be working with somebody who only uses a certain tool. And now if you talk in code and they talk in that tool communication becomes difficult and that just makes your life harder. So it's important for you to know Excel, Tableau, SQL very well. So we cover all of that. Yeah, and uh, we can take questions now. I know we have a lot of questions here. So we'll take a few questions. And if you've made it this far, you've, you've watched a two hour, two and a half hour lecture on uh, building a data analysis project. So you're probably really interested in this topic. Uh, so please do consider joining. And um, what we'll do is we'll send you an email with a discount coupon as well uh, for sticking through to the end. So that's a that's a small gift that we can give you. Okay, let's see. If we want to do a map, we may need the long and lat. Yeah, that's right. So that's one question. Let's see. So there was a question. Please ask questions from the views while you are live. Okay, so that it can be more, oh, I'm so sorry, did not get a chance to cover questions earlier. You have a lot of zeros, do you think you need to remove them? Yeah, so there's a question, what happens, what to do if you have a lot of zeros in a particular column? So let's say you have a column which, which has 60-70% zeros. Now that prob column probably isn't going to be too useful then. And at that point you may just want to drop that column altogether. On the other hand, you have a column or you have a few columns. Let's say you have 10 different columns, all of which have about 5% zeros. And those are all occurring in the similar in similar rows. So if you have 10 columns, all of which have about 4 or 5% zeros, and those are all occurring in similar rows, and you want to do some analysis on those columns, then one thing that you could do is you could simply remove the rows where the zeros are occurring, right? So that is something where you have to apply your mind as a data analyst. If, if you see that, should I drop the column altogether or can I exclude some of these rows which have missing values for a particular very important column? Let's say I don't have information about a city for certain, for certain uh, rows of data. Maybe I don't want to analyze them because I am doing a more geographic analysis, right? Or on the other hand, if I'm not doing a geographic analysis, I'm doing a time-based analysis, then maybe we can keep those rows. And similarly, if uh, let's say we have a start time, end time. So if we only want to analyze columns, uh, only want to analyze accidents that are spread out over time, we may want to remove the columns which or remove the rows which do not have an end time, right? So it's really, there's no single perfect answer. It's really something that you have to think about and uh, determine on a case to case basis. Okay, there's a question. Can you do a geospatial analysis of the data set? I think we started it. We definitely started it. We definitely drew some heat maps. Uh, but I'll be very honest with you. I haven't explored heat maps uh, or maps in a lot of detail yet. Although I am learning them myself for the uh, for the upcoming bootcamp. So do join us then. But in the meantime, look up Folium as I just looked up. And this is really the first or the second time I've used Folium. So we've done everything from scratch here. Uh, there's a question, can anyone summarize the project? The project, sum the summary roughly is we are analyzing US accidents data. We are analyzing US accidents data uh, in different dimensions. So we're looking at how accident data varies with time and how accidents vary with geography. Okay, then there's a question, what is your target audience for the bootcamp? $2.75 a month sounds very steep. Uh, thanks for the question and we understand that dollar two seventy five a month does um, is a little bit on the higher side now the reason for that is 
because this is a career oriented boot camp this is something that is as far as we are concerned almost certainly going to make you job ready so at the end of it you will have a job and you will probably see a significant salary bump from uh, uh, because if you look at cer certain data analyst roles and the the kind of salaries that you have um now i'm i'm sure if you're targeting it then you are looking at a salary increase there so you will see a significant salary bump uh, but to achieve that we need to work closely we need to work closely with everybody in the boot camp and as a team uh, we we are taking out a big chunk of our time and spending 6 months with everybody every single person on the boot camp right so in a sense it is almost a, we think it's a fairly reasonable price that we've set it in india it comes down to about 20000 rupees a month and uh, we think that 20000 rupees a month over 6 months is something that is fairly justifiable if you are looking for a career transition especially for the amount of time and the amount of uh, resources and the amount of guidance that you will get out of it right and we understand unfortunately that not everybody can take it right now which is why we are also offering a pay after placement option for very few people only uh, it's a very limited program but if you go on the boot camp page you have here you can see uh, apply for scholarship button and here you can apply for a pay after placement scholarship and the terms are slightly different here you pay a small amount right now and then you pay the rest once you get a job so you can read the terms on that form okay <clears throat> then there's a question rush hour yeah we did figure out that 9 to 12 is a, or 7 to 10 is a rush hour and similarly 3 to 6 Okay then there is a question when we find an external data how can we merge it with the list that i am working on so in pandas one thing you would want to do is you would get get that external data as csv as well and then you would load that csv into pandas and then you would then merge that csv with the existing dataset using the merge functionality in pandas so you can look up merge in pandas pandas dot data frame dot merge, that's a that's what you need, and you can look at the documentation. And as I've said, a lot of these things you just have to look at a documentation or look at a tutorial or a Stack Overflow question and get it done, right? Data analysis is not so much about knowing these tools uh, by heart; it's about being able to find the right function to do what you want, right? so that's part of the skills that it's it's not that you should just know pandas you should know how to figure out how how to merge two lists okay then maybe christmas season yeah so this was an interest yeah this was an interesting one where we saw that over time over time the data um, we saw that if you look at the trend of months you could see that november december was kind of up, uh, was kind of higher than the other months but then when we looked at it in depth because that didn't make sense to me uh, the in fact the trend that i had in mind would be quite the opposite that maybe not as many people are traveling in the winter months in, during the holidays so or and there's definitely no no rush hour traffic during the holidays so probably the accidents should be fewer so that's what i thought Uh, but then the the other thing is also that it's winter roads can be slippery in some places you have ice uh, on the roads or snow or ice on the roads and that can lead to higher accidents but in any case it doesn't make sense that there would be 20 or 30% or 25 30% higher accidents in november or december intuitively and that's why we decided to look at year wise distributions and then we when we did that we realized that 2019 has a uniform distribution and 2016 has a lot of missing data not only that we also realized that we also realized that the data from bing is probably faulty does not have the right distribution but the data from mapquest does now of course we don't know which one is faulty and which one is not that's something that we'll have to look up and that's some external data but the assumption is at least looking at the uniform distribution that probably mapquest is the more reliable one then we looked at the amount of data in map uh, mapquest versus bing and it seemed like 65% of the data comes from mapquest so we can even just throw away bing then we did a heat map so we did also try a heat map and then we put a we drew a heat map and we saw many issues when you're working with 4 million data points 
so wherever you find that you're putting dots on a map or doing some aggregations it always helps to take a sample because the sample will have more or less similar characteristics as the overall data set so yeah then we also saw how to put markers on maps and once again it's not something too complicated you know it may seem difficult okay how do i draw a map and how do i put markers on a map and how do i uh, do this and do that and make make it interactive etc etc all you really have to do is look it up and all of these libraries exist to make your job easier not harder right so don't be afraid of these libraries rather try to find ways to get them to do what you want uh, that's all you need you don't have to know folium inside out you just need to know if i tell you to build a heat map you need to know how to figure out and build a heat map whether it is by looking at tutorials looking at documentation asking a question on stack overflow or literally just um getting on a call with somebody and trying to figure it out okay then then there's a question about um, make a session on your journey to becoming a data scientist sure we would um, we would definitely do a session on that someday where we can talk about that uh, it's been a interesting and wonderful journey so there's definitely a lot of sh a lot to share there as well i think that covers most of the questions okay i see Uh, there there are a few more questions how to find people with similar interest in data science to work on interesting projects check out the jovian forum jovian.ai/forum that's a great place there are also a lot of great telegram and uh, there are a lot of great chat groups so you can find some groups on telegram or slack or discord and just post your idea there so that's one option for you then can we apply for a boot camp in further days or is it limited for some time so the the first batch for the boot camp starts on the 15th of march so you would have to apply i and the seats are also limited there are only about 100 seats right now so and we have not yet planned a second batch because we want to work closely with the first batch and get good results and we'll only do a second batch once we have we have gotten great results for everybody in the first batch so i would suggest applying now okay next question is how to add a folio map in a blog post with hover feature that might be difficult that may not be possible to embed a folio map but what you can do is i think a folio map should show up let's see here a folio map should probably show up in your jovian notebook let's just scroll down if not we will add support for it yeah you have the full no sorry this is the matplotlib map yeah so you have the folium map right so you can take the folium map and then come to this cell and then click on embed cell and uh, select output and then simply copy if you're working with a normal a blogging platform which allows embedding iframes then you can copy the iframe otherwise you can copy the link and then you can go on let's say medium.com so medium.com supports embedding by link so i'm just going to go on medium.com here and create a new story and then map in a blog post and i'm simply going to paste this link here here's a map embedded in a blog post yeah and you will not see a detailed uh you will not see a detailed um, view here but if i copy the draft link and open the draft link in an in incognito window or if you once you just publish it okay let's you know what let's just go ahead and publish it and we'll delete it later i don't want to deal with this right now but let's see
okay there are there seem to be some issues here but uh, we'll we'll take care of it but this should generally work i think it could just be something that is happening just right now but do check this out um you can take the map link and you can embed it within medium and if there's an issue on from our end on jovian we'll fix it in a day or two so don't worry about that but this is how you embed a map within a blog post you can use the embed cell functionality from jovian Okay, hi, can we use Spark here instead of Pandas and how will it be different in terms of code complexity and efficiency? Okay, that is, I guess, a bigger discussion to get into. Spark may not be the right choice here because Spark is probably better suited for bigger data, much bigger data. What you can use is you can use a library called Dask and a li the Dask library will allow you to do the same operations that you're doing with pandas and do them much faster and it has the exact same api so you don't need to change anything you just import dasks.dataframe as pd instead of pandas.dataframe uh, so that's something that you can check out now spark is a whole different discussion uh, which unfortunately i don't want to get into and i at the moment cannot say i have enough expertise over either is it necessary to be familiar with in different domains if you're pursuing a job in data anal analysis? No, if you're pursuing a job as a data analyst, uh, these are all the things that you need to know. So we have, what we've done is we've analyzed over 200 or so job listings and we've used pandas and other, these other tools like that to pick out the exact set of skills that are expected from data analysts. So the exact set of skills are programming, statistics, data analysis, visualization, machine learning a good to have thing excel sql and some analytics tools like tableau or power bi this is the exact sort of skills you need now what what is true however is that once you get into a company obviously that company will be have a domain that it is working in so you will have to do some special learning about the domain but generally that is a more of a surface level learning at least initially that will suffice where you know during the orientation you will be told what the company does and what the data looks like uh, but you may want to over time get deeper and deeper because here we are analyzing accidents data now we did need to go and figure out what the sources of the data were and we did need to then also go and check how many cities there are in the us right so you uncover information about the domain that you are getting into slowly uh, and it happens very organically right so don't be close to it don't uh, you should never say that i'm a data analyst i'm only going to write the code and do analysis if i'm in a medical domain i'm not going to learn anything about that domain no don't we don't do that but on the other hand you also don't need to spend a year learning about the domain to get into that field right you get into the field and keep digging in and keep learning the things that you need to learn okay next question is do you have any experience on big data engineer yeah some of it i have done some work with hadoop and a little bit with spark as well um at the moment we're not really offering any courses on big data engineering and part of the reason is oh, we want to go step by step and that brings me to the next question which is the first step for a fresher data analyst data scientist or big data engineer the first step for you in data science should be data analyst absolutely no doubt about that because everything else to some extent builds on top of the data analyst role so the data scientist role obviously requires you to have all the skills that you have as a data analyst and many more things because then a data scientist role will also require you to know machine learning or deep learning or uh, certain other things like let's say applying research applying research papers to the problems at hand so it's also a more research oriented kind of role the data scientist role building models training models and even a little bit of deployment then the data engineer role will take the same things that you do as a data analyst but do them at scale so you will instead of using pandas you will be using probably spark um, you will be setting up etl pipelines and jobs so it also requires some knowledge of the cloud it also requires some knowledge of um, automation so devops essentially so that's definitely uh, an, an area but it again builds on top it also requires a good software engineering background but it builds on top of what you know as a data analyst right a good set of a good data analysis background 
will set you up really well for a machine learning engineer role will set you up really well for a data engineer role will set you up really well for a deep learning engineer role uh, or even a data scientist role next i want to learn deep learning are you offering any course on deep learning we do have a course called 02gans.com so you can go to 02gans.com and that is a course on deep learning that you can check out and you can it's a six week course where you learn the basics of deep learning using the pytorch framework and you build some pretty good models very close to the state of the art okay what is your view on azure click and drop models so the question is about drag and drop ml models or auto ml models now there's definitely a place for them because not everybody can learn data science and machine learning but at the moment the tools such tools are quite rudimentary like even in data analysis as you saw we had to separate things out by year and then you know do filtering and sorting and th things like that so anytime you're doing something non trivial you will very quickly hit the limitations of some of these tools so keep that in mind and what i'd suggest is if you are interested in data science start with code and once you know how to write the code using these tools will be very straightforward for you and in a lot of cases you will find that these tools simply slow you down uh, although they are very useful for somebody who's not familiar with the domain right so there's definitely a place for them but if you are interested in seriously pursuing data science definitely start with code okay i think we've gone on far longer than we anticipated but thank you all uh, i can still see quite a few people still watching the stream so thank you for joining and this was uh, wonderful uh, we will share all the resources with you we will share the notebook that we've created in this workshop it was fun doing it live we will share the link to the boot camp and we will also share an exclusive discount for you for attending the workshop and we also have a referral program so if you know other people who have uh, who would be interested you can refer them and you can earn a fund a further discount as well right so you can earn a 10 percent discount on what you've paid for every person you refer so all you need to do is refer people and then let us know their email and of course you need to be signed up as well so definitely do that uh, one last question after completing data analyst which sector is easy to move data science or machine learning i would say that you can get into a data analyst role now data data science machine learning is practically the same thing up, up beyond data analyst what you're essentially going to be doing is either machine learning and deep learning or you will be doing data engineering so those will be the two choices and i would say that after becoming becoming a data analyst the next step for you would be to get into a machine learning role like a machine learning engineer role okay thank you very much and i will talk to you soon Good night and yeah thanks a lot for joining and good night and good night or good day depending on where you are bye